Okay, um, like I just told the class, I think it's just easier to show you rather than explain to you, which typically we try to do on the last day of the week so you have somewhat of an idea. Um, but as you can see, this is updated. Uh, we'll get that on the board probably, well, I wouldn't say probably, but hopefully somewhere by the end of the day. So uh, I think we're up to digestion. We'll do that today. Um, oh, I guess organics up there. Uh, we'll finish up digestion, circulation, respiration. The idea behind this is uh, it says pigeon dissection. Um, that uh, I, I think I still have some specimens from last year. So the idea is to be over there on Thursday, but we may move that up a day and, and uh, see how that goes. We might do that today, um, but keep in mind that probably sometime next week we'll have two uh, vocabulary evaluations, if I'm not mistaken, because as you're aware, there is a lot um, to, to know, and that's provided for you in your handout. So that's what uh, we plan on doing at some point this week. We'll see how it goes. Uh, of course, everything's open for interpretation when it comes to uh, the fine weather that we've been having. I think uh, we can probably speak for everyone, unless you're a snowmobiler, but I think we can speak for everyone that uh, we're ready to move on and start to have, on average, more normal temperatures, probably in the 40s, so we're talking about thunderstorms rather than uh, snowstorms. Now, whether that happens or not, uh, as this week progresses, that might have a bearing on whether we move that up again or not because I would be led to believe should we have another late start well then that probably means that um, we'll flip-flop uh, we'll have first hour at this point second hour up until dinner and then move on to our normal uh, afternoon classes so um, that's somewhat of an idea of what we're going to try to accomplish this week other than I need to get batteries for my mouse but here's approximately where we left off and we'll continue with this maybe all right so as you're looking at this how is molting different in waterfowl than game birds like pheasants or raptors like falcons and hawks. How's waterfowl different? Right, and I, I don't know, I don't think I've ever seen this before. I, I think you would have to be someone working for the GFP that might have a better uh, understanding of this and the time of year when this happens, I, I'm not sure with that either because as we're probably aware that ducks and geese are both that go through uh, regular migrations. And what that means is if, I always got to think about this, but I believe uh, the southern migration is to get to the breeding grounds, okay? Now is that true for all birds? Maybe not. but for mainly for waterfowl, I, th I think that's perhaps true, especially for geese. And then when it comes to the northern migrations, it's time to get to the feeding grounds. Now, that's not going to happen anytime soon because I, I don't know if I think the way Mother Nature would speak to these animals is I, I would think they're smart enough to know that if they look down and see white instead of brown, that okay it's time to stop so at about I don't know how high in the air it's just a guess we'll just say uh, 300 feet in the air when we're saying looking down and they see brown what are we referring to In instead of white what's obviously the white color Snow, snowpack, okay? So they're certainly not going to go into an area where there's snowpack and chances are the uh, waterways are still covered or frozen. I, I, think, uh, I think that would certainly be true. So I, I think it's fair to say that they're probably smart enough to look down and say, oh, geez, there's uh, 
there's, there's brown ground here, we're safe. And all of a sudden, some of these cutoff lines, as far as the, the storms are concerned, and the snowpack is actually um, probably pretty sharp. I think even for road conditions, I think by the time you get south of Baltic, it's much, much better than it is on this side of, uh, uh, you could say, of, of Del Rapids. So uh, with that, I, I certainly think that would have something to do with their migrations. And when this would happen, to, to me, I think that would be when they're in the, I almost said the northern hemisphere. They're not going to leave the northern hemisphere, I don't think. I don't believe they go all the way down to, uh, how far is that? Is that Mexico? I, I think the Tropic of Cancer goes through North America. The equator, of course, goes through Africa. And um, I don't know where. My geography is not that good. I would think it goes through somewhere in Central America. And then the midline in the south between the equator and the south pole is the Tropic of what? Not Cancer. That's in the northern hemisphere. Tropic of Cancer, and then the Tropic of... You're closer to geography than myself. Isn't the Tropic of Capricorn? I'm going to have to talk with Mr. Deitch and say, what are you teaching these students? How long ago? Eighth grade. Eighth grade. 25 years for me. Or is that just knowing useless facts? No, it, it, I, you can. But the interpretation, okay, I think I'll, okay, I'll move on. We know when we're defeated. Okay, so the skeleton. All along we've been saying that these animals, in order for them to take flight, okay, this had to happen. They had to become lightweight, but yet you can't sacrifice the strength in these structures, okay? They have to be obviously quite strong with the strains of flight, but yet be uh, li lighter in weight. And to, to me, this is, uh, I don't know how you can explain that. To me, that's just craziness, if you ask me, just the way Mother Nature designed these animals, okay? The skeleton actually weighs less than all of its feathers put together. I think anyone would say, are those feathers just totally, uh, uh, what do I want to say, damp or soaked in water? Well, I, I don't think so. But uh, to me, that's actually pretty cr and, and And I think one way to look at that is, okay, when you're talking about all these bones, their weight is spread out quite a bit. So I think when you're actually weighing all of those, when you're, you're spreading out the, uh, what do I want to say, the uh, uh, pressure on them, um, uh, and this goes back to physical science. Yay. No. Should you be uh, finding yourself on a, a frozen uh, surface? How do you give your chance the, how do you give yourself the best chance to not fall through? It's not a guarantee, but if you want to increase your odds of not falling through, spread yeah, spread your weight out. So I think once this happens, once you spread out all the weight of these bones, I think you could say maybe that's the same type of concept. You just, when you're piling these feathers on, they're all compacted, so that gives them probably a little more weight. But nonetheless, uh, give uh, the man upstairs his due on how these animals were designed. Okay? Frigate bird kind of lines up with that pepperoni, pepperoni, pepperoni. Come on, you want a pepperoni, pepperoni, pepperoni? Come on, who wants a pepperoni, pepperoni, pepperoni? Sure. Oh, okay, so we got one. All right. So, moving on.
Now, to me, this term is quite, you could almost say it's quite vague. And when you see this, okay, would this be true of modern birds? And when you think, when you, before you say something, that would be yes and no, okay? Because yes, there's quite a bit of strength in raptors, but you got to remember those beaks are really, really sharp. Okay, but there still has to be a driving force to close that beak. On the other hand, typically when we think of jaws, okay, not necessarily just the fish, but that's we we spend so much time thinking about that and saying, okay, why are the sharks so successful? Well. They've got these strong jaws, okay? It's great to have sharp teeth, but if you don't have a strong jaw to drive them, it's probably not gonna do any good. But in this case, jaws is really only, we're referring to that of the Archaeopteryx because that was an avian-like characteristic that was still reptilian as well, okay? Because now, as you can see, modern birds are completely toothless. So a raptor, we just said, how can a raptor cut through that flesh? Not just its sharp, pointed beak, but what about the sides of its beak? And, and, it, and it's hard to, the narrator saying that they're razor sharp. So I really don't think you want to try to, let's say, uh, question Mother Nature. I think it's one of those aspects, yes, if you put your finger in there, it's probably not going to be chopped off but I certainly think it could be enough damage, like if you've ever, um, does anyone have like a potato slicer? Okay, be darn careful with those, obviously. To me, I think that would be fairly comparable what a large raptor could do to your finger, just like a slicer could do um, to, your, to your fingers. Okay, I wanna get through this one and this one, because let's try, oh geez. Is this ever going to end? Okay. Okay, so this is where, okay. Because this, we could say, is another reptilian characteristic. Allows the mouth to open wide. Okay? Now, it's probably not so much of what I want to say, uh, a requirement for cardinals, for finches, and robins, okay? Because their diet might be consisted of what, do you think? Just think about that for a moment. And i got to keep an eye on the time because, as we all know, this is a shortened class period. So we're a little behind schedule, but that's nobody's uh, have nothing to no control over that. So what is the diet of those animals? Robins, finches, cardinals. Do you think? Okay, robins. That's right. Yes, berries. That's not what I would have thought, but you're not wrong because when you are saying berries, chances are those animals want to get into what's inside the berries, which is what? Yeah, the, the seeds. And I think it's been told to myself that if you want to attract uh, Orioles, that it is maybe oranges, perhaps you cut in half. I don't think it's grapefruit, but they'll... Uh, They'll go nuts over that. And uh, again, this type of weather, it's just so hard on these animals. And, uh, uh, and we knew going, coming into this, well, we figured that this winter was going to be, I'm not saying one for the record books, but sure has been a doozy. I think we can agree with that. Okay. Why don't we wrap up uh, the vertebral column, and then we'll start with the forelimbs tomorrow. And there's no, I used to have two sections of this class. That's why that's colored the way it is.
Okay, so Mother Nature decided to do this, okay? These vertebrae are completely fused except for the cervical type. Where do you find those? A and P don't let me down. Anatomy and physiology. Cervical vertebrae, where do we find those? Yeah, it's in your neck. So there's no surprise that if those were completely fused, okay, a lot of these birds, I think if we really wanted to creep you people out, because it would me, seriously, it would, to have someone standing like this and then their hands are up here, but yet their face is looking right at you. Okay, so the idea, yeah, you can do this, but it's not directly looking, because we can't do that. We just don't have that capability. But sometimes if you're at a job where, <laughs> like if I'm running a, a snowblower and a tractor, when we all know they're on the three point and they're behind you, well, you got to look to see where you're going. So sometimes you feel like an owl maybe by the time you're done, which is uh, not great, but because you're always turning around and, and uh, trying to look behind you. But uh, that just would not be possible if these were fused, okay? Because fused means it's one that's going to interlock and it's not going to have that per se uh, flexibility, okay? And... Uh, I, I think you could say, supernaturally speaking, yeah. It's been seen in the movies where, and I, I'm not a horror movie person, but I don't even think I have to go any further than for you to understand or realize what movie, what, what movie might we be talking about where zzz, the head goes in 360 degrees or 270 maybe. It was one of those that was remade. Uh, uh, starts with an E. Kind of, kind of makes you think of exercise, but so X or something. Demon, I cast you out. Who does that besides a priest? An exorcist. Is that what you're trying to? Think of. I, I don't know. Maybe there's more movies where we see the turning of the heads and, and, and things like that. But, all right. So that's enough for, for that. But regardless, and sometimes for us as humans, there, there is some flexibility, but our vertebrae are not totally fused because that would limit your mobility. But sometimes that has to happen. Okay. But in this case, we're not birds. So, um, Let's leave uh, credit where it's due with uh, the avian class. Okay, I know I said I'm going to one more, but I think we'll stop there for today. We will catch up to you next time.